Okay, good morning. Uh, so, uh, so real pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. David Redden, who's going to lead the next three sessions. Um, he's uh, the vice chair of the Department of Biostatistics in the School of Public Health. He's done, I think, all of his education in Alabama, uh, but has been at UAB for uh, 23, 23, 23 years. Yeah, 23 years now. Um, he's really dedicated to teaching. Uh, he's a very active biostatistician in lots of different clinical areas. He's the director of the CCTS BIRD unit, which is Biostatistics Epidemiology and Research Design Unit. Um, he's not here all the time, but he's one of the people you'll encounter if you come for a BIRD drop-in clinic. Um, he's very eager to help make sure that you get in touch with the particular kind of methodologist you may need. Uh, so really use him as a resource. Um, he's very active in several other units of the, uh, in the university. The, we have a large NIAMS funded uh, P60, I think it's still active. The, uh, the P60 is, is still active, the gout, we've got a P50, the gout court, the rheumatology. Right. So he's the director of the biostatistical units and all those. So you know that he really is very well connected around the, uh, the university. So um, for me, he's made fundamental principles in biostatistics, something I can actually remember, uh, so <laughs> I think you'll really enjoy the next several weeks. All right, so uh, hopefully everybody can hear me that's online. Uh, all right, so I've got what, till 9.30? 10, until 9.30 is, is what I heard. <laughs> I have until 9.30 is what I heard loud and clear. Shouldn't have said that in front of David. But, uh, so we'll go a little bit, take a break, and then we'll wind down. I am going to be way too ambitious today, okay? Um, there will be three lectures, and um, the main thing there are certain set really key points that I want you to take away. First, David's already hit that. On Monday from 10 to 2, every week, in the Lister Hill Library on the fourth floor, I sit there and design things for everybody. Or if you have a paper and it's, hey, David is, I, I, you know, I need some help understanding the best way to present this. There isn't a question in methodology that I'm not willing to try to help you out with. Those clinics run Monday, 10 to two. That's the one that I'm in. There's another clinic that runs Wednesday here from 11.30 to one. That one has lunch. So if you want to, if you want lunch with your advice, come to the Wednesday one. The other thing I'm going to talk to you about is simply this. And, you know, everybody says, oh, he is uh, such a nice guy. Actually, I'm arrogant. And I'm going to tell you why I'm arrogant. I believe that most of all statistics that we teach, we teach incorrectly. We teach it based on formula first, in that we do not really go and discuss the true concepts and anchor in concepts first before we try to apply it. So my general approach, especially when I teach anything, any overview is you may, I'm sorry, you may have years and years of experience in research. It never hurts to go back and look at the fundamentals and ask yourself how those fundamentals actually should be impacting everything that we're doing. So I'm going to back us up. I'm going to actually tell you how I think when someone comes in to the clinic and hits me with, like they did on Monday, okay, here's the microbiome of a coral reef off of the coast of, off of Key Largo. And we're trying to investigate what's causing these, and she called them blisters. Okay, let's talk about that. What had to go through my mind as she's trying to explain that to me? So I'm gonna talk about statistical inference. I'm gonna tell you every textbook written in statistics is written in the wrong order. I'm not saying they've got their information wrong, they just didn't put it in the right order. I will always think, anytime someone comes talks to me, the first thing I think about is not necessarily what is the analysis I'm going to do. I actually try to ask myself, what has this person measured 
or are they going to measure and what probability distribution could be associated with that type of measurement? That's the first question I ask myself as a practicing statistician. And then I need you to remember something, that every statistic that is summarized that you ever see, it is an amazing fact. We can link that to a probability distribution. And that's the whole idea, is that not only do I understand probability, but when I measure something and I calculate a sample mean, oh, you have three groups and I calculate three sample means, I know that those means can be associated with a distribution. And that gives me the ability to make judgments. Should I have seen it, yes or no? We'll get through those. We'll get to the central limit theorem. I'm never gonna get through the power. The power is actually, power and correlation are thrown out into two other um, pieces. I'm gonna talk about the key terms correctly defined. At the end of the day, I really want you to have three things. Love the Captain America socks. Um, I want you to be able to understand the way I think about it. I wanna make certain that the key concepts are understood because yet last night I was on email with a very senior investigator that I thought we were discussing a very fundamental concept. She's highly, highly funded, very successful. There's no other way around it. But in our conversations, I had to recognize she does not really understand when I say R squared, what that actually measures. We need to make certain that we have a true understanding I don't mean that bad. I, I have three teenage daughters. I'm helping them through one of them through geometry right now. And one of the things I have to keep telling her, telling her is don't fool yourself into believing you understand it. If you can explain it to somebody, you understand it. But if you can't explain it back to me, you're fooling yourself into believing you've got it down. So don't worry about power and correlation. We're not going to get there. Okay. So with a brief overview of statistics, my comment to you is that we, uh, all, if you open up any, I got a broad, I've got a kind of my office, I have hundreds of them. They always start out with summarizing data and descriptive statistics. You get all the formulas, you get hit immediately. Remember that? You go in, here's the formula for variance, here's the formula for correlation, here's the formula for all these other things, and you feel like, okay, I've got to understand all these formulas, I've got to remember them all. No, no. Then, out of nowhere, they make this incredible shift. You do all this work on data, and then they make you start doing all these crazy laws of probability, and they don't seem to go together. And then out of nowhere, you get into probability distribution and hypothesis testing. Okay, what's missing in all of that is how those things actually are supposed to piece together. I would, if I was going to teach you, I would teach you going this way. First, let's talk about probability, okay? Then let's go to statistics, and then let's go to what I call statistical inference. Let's go to hypothesis testing. Because here's a secret that I try to get everybody to understand. It's very simple, but we lose it in all the mechanics. There is a probability distribution governing in bottom line is simply this is the way a statistician thinks. If it's a physical measurement such as my blood pressure, there is a probability distribution sitting behind that. You could put a blood pressure cuff on my arm and we could monitor it all day long. But what you're realizing in those measurements is the probability distribution governing what's going on under that physical function. The probability distribution passes its characteristics into the data. From the data, I make judgments. I really am only using the data as a surrogate to look back. That's what I'm really trying to do. Every time I do a hypothesis test, I'm not doing a hypothesis test about your data. That's a misunderstanding. I'm actually conducting hypothesis tests as to how many probability distributions are in your data set. It's really what I'm asking. Okay? 
that's what I want you. That's one of the key figures. They always say, when they taught me to lecture in, undergrad, in, in graduate school, they said, always emphasize, these are the take home points. Say it over and over, take home points. Bird clinics, take home point two, this is key. Everybody obsesses about this piece, observations or data. The very first thing, if you came in for a consult, I would ask you, what have you measured? Well, I have measured whether they have this disease or not. Do you know what you just told me? You've limited me to a certain set of probability distributions. At that point, I know certain things that I have to be prepared to do with regard to analysis. If you tell me, no, 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 I'm measuring something much more continuous. It doesn't tell me exactly the probability distribution, but it tells me what set of probability distributions I can consider. So it's always a little bit of being a mathematical detective. You give me this, and I try to guess what's behind the curtain and make judgments about what's behind the curtain. Okay, and in a sense, because you can never see the probability distribution, you can see the data that was generated, but there is a key fact. There are three things to always remember. The data must inherit the characteristics from its probability distribution, it cannot differ. The data will inherit the characteristics of its probability distribution, which means its center, its spread, where does it balance? How much does it spread out? And the last thing, it will inherit the shape. So from those things, that's why I always have to look at histograms. Why am I so worried about looking at histograms? Because the histograms tell me what the possible shape of the probability distribution is. Okay? And from this, once I have these things, I can make statistical inference. But the key thing is the statistical inference is not about this. It's not about that. It's about all the way back up to the top, all the way back to the probability distribution. So like our classic teaching example, you all did the two sample t-test. I'm sure you all all had the lovely glory of working a two sample t-test. And let's say I have cholesterol levels which for men and cholesterol levels for women. And I want to do a hypothesis test. What are you really testing there? Do you know? You know that if the p-value is less than 0.05, you should be happy. But what are you really testing? Whatever distributions overlap. Not that they overlap. No, you're asking: Are they over the? Or are they aligned right on top of each other? If you're assuming that the distributions have equal variance, the only last thing that can vary is their means. So you're asking. Do they overlap completely? In other words, is there one distribution for both? Is there one probability distribution in governing both men and women? Or do I need to understand men have their probability distribution and women have their probability distribution? That's what the two-sample t-test is actually trying to get to. Right? But notice I didn't say, do men and women have different data? Well, of course they do. The real question is, do they have different probability distributions? Going back, first things first. Anytime I go to work on anything statistically, all I really want to understand is, and I have another talk that one day I might come back and give you that's called the seven magnificent questions. Uh, no, excuse me, the Magnificent Seven, Paul's, then Dash, questions for study design. The Magnificent Seven. And the first question is, what did you measure? What are you going to measure? What are you going to measure? Because I mean, you have to get the methodologist to understand that. And you as the investigators have to understand what you measure and how you measure it controls everything downstream. Nothing can deviate from that because those measurements restrict us to probability distributions and those measurements restrict us to specific analysis approaches, okay? 
Um, for example, you know, play these games, nature, you know, we got weather that produces hurricanes. We can talk about how many category four hurricanes per year. Classic teaching example, per year. Once I put out that word per year, you're restricted either to Poisson or something like the negative binomial because I'm counting rates. I'm counting events. Annual rainfall, rainfall could be much more continuous. Therefore, that would probably be much more of a normal distribution. Uh, my favorite, I'm gonna give you this teaching example really quick. Uh, biologically, you know, we got body temperature, blood pressure, body weight, all those are continuous. Um, my favorite teaching example is this, my father, uh, great guy, was very lucky in life to have a great mom, great dad. Uh, my dad passed away about six years ago. It's coming up on six years now. But in the last three years of his life, I had this recurring thing, okay? Dad was in and out of the hospital a lot. Um, and I would, and dad would, you know, my dad was always, not trying to be disrespectful to him, but he was the original obese guy. He was obese before the, he, he beat the epidemic. He's, he, 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 he may have been case one. Uh, he was just always a heavy guy. He was six foot four, huge guy, great guy. But he started, his kidneys started failing him. Not his heart, his kidneys started failing him. And we got into the hospital over and over because of kidney problems. And I would ask the nurses while we were there, I would say, what's dad's temperature? And they would say to me, oh, he's perfectly fine. He's got a body temperature of 97.2. And I would shake my head and I would say, I didn't think you need a culture. And they would look at me like I was an idiot. Because I'm a mathematician, I'm not an MD. That's all I am, a glorified mathematician. You know what? I don't know. Um, I would say he's running a fever. They look at me and go, no, he's not. And I would have to say, for all of my adult life, since my mother is gone and I have attended every doctor's visit with my father, my father's body temperatures mean is typically sitting somewhere around 96. He is nowhere ever near 98.6. I have been with him in all these doctor visits and his body temperature just typically runs lower than average. He had a different probability distribution. He had a different mean. Sure enough, two or three days later, he would be really, really sick and he would have another kidney infection. But that's the idea, is the data, if you have enough data, you can make judgments about specific probability distributions. Engineering, my favorite teaching example I do in about three weeks is M&Ms. I actually bring in like 100 bags of M&Ms and we treat and we estimate the prevalence and the, prob the, dreaded, the probability of the dreaded blue M&M. What's the prevalence of that dreaded disease in the M&M population? And show them that if you give me enough data, I can estimate really precisely characteristics of a probability distribution. The other thing is for some reason Mars feels like it should be a top secret thing in the world what those numbers are. Okay, don't tell me. I can solve that with about 100 bags of M&M, so it's not that big of a problem. Thing is this, if you, if it's variation, I'm gonna get, I notice I'll, I watch eyes when I talk. I do watch people's eyes. And I noticed a couple of times when I've said probability distribution, probably it's been too abstract. You're frustrated with me. Define it, man. Would you just please define that? A distribution is nothing but a mathematical model that describes the tendencies and variations of data. It's a complex equation sometimes. Sometimes, you know, I could, I could throw up the binomial distribution. I could throw up the Poisson distribution. We have equations for them. The equations aren't what is important. You have to realize that data sets actually are being generated from those distributions that we know they exist in nature. We have derived them. The Poisson was actually discovered in the Guinness Brewery. I kid you not. The first biological evidence, the Poisson distribution, we found it, was in the vat of the yeast of a, it was the number of live yeast left in a vat of beer. 50 gallons. 
Okay? But the thing is, is I'm studying variation. I'm really just studying variation. I'm studying patterns. If you don't have any variability in the data, don't worry, you don't need me. You don't need me if there's no variance. Because if there's no variance, there is no probability. All right, why? Uh, so that's the whole point is I'm just linking them back. Poisson distribution, number of category four hurricanes per year. Poisson distribution, the number of unexploded bombs per square block, Tokyo. There's still unexploded bombs. Same goes for London. Number of shipwrecks per square mile, bottom of the Atlantic, Poisson distribution. The number of yeast in your bottle of beer, still alive, 12 fluid ounces. Binomial, so just the first introductory stats course really just should teach how you pair these things up. That you realize the nature of the data, match must match the nature of your probability distribution. That's it. Nothing more complex. So be prepared to know what you've been measuring, what you're measuring. And talk to somebody about it. That's it. Nothing more complicated. Now we get into the, the formulas. Once we get beyond the probability distribution and the rudimentary understanding of that, this is where, okay, I need to know, I need to be able to describe the probability distribution. Well, I can't get there. So I describe it from the data because I take the sample mean, because I know the sample mean, the, the mean of the data has to be somewhere near the mean of the probability distribution. They have to align. Now think about that going back to my teaching example. If I calculate a mean for my women and I calculate a sample mean for my men and they're really right on top of each other, those two means falling together, very close together, we've got to figure out what together means or close means. We've got to come up with a mathematical definition for that. But if they're close together, you would have a reason to doubt that there's two distributions out there. The closer they are, the more likely they're coming from one distribution. But if they're very far apart, then you've got to ask yourself what distribution could possibly produce those things that are that far apart, it's not likely, likely probably two distributions <laughs> hiding in there. It's the whole game. So you've got the sample mean, sample variance. These are the, remember I told you, I told you, probability distributions are summarized. We don't keep all those formulas in our heads. What we do is we know where their centers are, how much they spread out, and what's their shape. The only reason we teach these two things, these are estimations of center, that's the estimation of spread. That's all it is. So from those two st sample statistics, I'm making judgments about what's hidden behind the ground, but behind the curtain. That's all. I'm trying to summarize two of the three characteristics. Okay? And I'm going to talk to you about this. Because the data inherits characteristics from the probability distribution, Statistics can be used to, and here we go with that word, infer. You hear all the time, statistical inference. It sounds really, really like etch. It sounds fancy. Statistical inference. I'm trying to make a judgment. I'm just making a judgment. I'm, I'm using decision theory to say, there's one, I think there's, I, I have evidence that there's two distributions, or I don't have evidence, and therefore we're gonna have to assume the data is indicating one, or maybe there's three. Maybe we we just have to we have to come in and study. Under certain key assumptions, you know exactly what probability distributions govern your statistics. Okay, now here's the mind blowing fact: the data that generated, excuse me, the probability generated data that generated the, <coughs> the probability distribution. That, generated the data may not be associated with the summary statistic. And I'm gonna show you that in just a minute. The descriptive statistic, I can't speak this morning, I should have had more coffee, may differ from the probability distribution governing the data. That's why, do y'all remember this really mind-blowing, confusing thing that no statistician could ever successfully explain to you, no matter how many times they talk about it, called the central limit theorem. You ever heard of that? 
No. The central limit theorem is that idea. The central limit theorem simply says, you give me a large enough data set, I'll calculate X bar for you. Okay. And as long as it's large enough, and as long as I know what the variance is going, what the variance should be, then I know that that sample mean is going to follow a bell. Period. Now, what people, what I spend almost a full week of lecture in the undergraduates and the introductory graduate school for is emphasizing and showing them something's missing. I didn't tell you what the underlying probability distribution was. If the data comes from binomial, I can still calculate a sample mean and it will follow a normal distribution. The data could come from multiple Poisson, multiple outputs from a Poisson data set. But if I calculate the sample mean, it's gonna go to the normal distribution. The normal, dis the, the sample mean always gravitates toward the normal distribution. And because of that, I can, the only reason we really study probability distributions is we wanna know what's rare. I mean, if I told you there are gonna be 25 category four storms next year to hit the Gulf, to hit the Eastern seaboard of the United States, do you think it's normal? Do you think that's typical? No, that would not happen in one, and we haven't seen that in 300 years. So that would be, something's changed, something's wrong, because that probability would be really, really low based on historical evidence. My other favorite teaching example, I'm just gonna start dating myself. Gotta watch the clock. I was here on September 11th, 2001. I was scheduled to lecture that day as everything is going on. Uh, and I was actually amazed. All the students showed up. I felt like most of them would be because that was a bad day in history. They came and I asked them, do they, do you mean to lecture yes or no? If you don't, I'm going to cancel this class with a, you're on the understanding that you won't time to process what's going on. They chose to lecture. We chose to lecture, so we kept going. A few days later, I'm sitting at home with my newborn who's about to graduate high school watching CNN and I hear something. I hear the, com the uh, news commentators say, today the CDC has reported four anthrax infections within this week and I get chills. And I get a second set of chills when the commentator says, but the CDC says there's no reason to be alarmed. I mean, I'm literally starting to sweat because I know what's going on. Do you know what the natural rate of anthrax infection is in the United States? The natural rate? One case per 20 years per 20 years, we saw four in three days. What do you conclude from probability? Something's going on. There's a terrorist attack. That's why we use this. We use this to say, here's what I've observed compared to my model that I assume to be true, one infection per 20 years. Should I have expected to see this? The answer is no. That's all that complex thing is telling you. That's what was hidden from you in that course. The only reason we teach this is you can come to me and say, David, I just calculated a sample mean and it is 20. David, I thought it was gonna be centered at 30. 
I thought we were going to do an experiment and all I tried to set my machine to consistently produce these things at 30, but my sample of 10 came at averaged out 25. David, should I readjust my machine? Yes, you should. It's a little bit too far off because the data is indicating you're not, you're not at the level you thought you should be. But it doesn't have to be a specific value. It could be how many distributions are out there. All right, let's go forward. What has happened now? There we go. Okay, so let's talk about correct terms defined. Stop reading the slide. Listen to me, please. Okay, I'm about to demystify. Oh, I'm going to teach you everything a PhD biostatistician needs to know in five minutes. All of my graduate training, everything I do on a day-to-day -day basis in a five-minute comment. And you'll be blown away by this. All right? Who wants to talk to me? Fine. I know that intimidating. In a jury trial, what is assumed? They're innocent. They're innocent. You know what that's called? A null hypothesis. That's a null hypothesis. What you assume to be true is your null hypothesis. Whenever you come to me to help you with methodology and we're going to use a p-value, we have established a null hypothesis. You and I have to discuss what is that null hypothesis. Usually that null hypothesis is there's no difference between the two groups. That's because we're going to assume that your experiment is designed to produce that, okay? So, but you must always ask yourself, and please hear me, if you do not know what the null hypothesis is, please don't report a p-value. Come talk to somebody before you put that p-value out there. Because every p-value, and I've had this debate a thousand times, well, What's your null, null hypothesis? They report a p-value, what's your null hypothesis? Well, there's no null hypothesis, then you don't know what you're doing. Sorry to be that dramatic, but that's the truth. So if you've got a p-value, there has to be a hypothesis test, period. Okay, what do you summon the jury to do? The jury has a choice, right? They are to evaluate the evidence. That's their, their charge. They are to evaluate the evidence. Guess what the evidence is in my job? Your data set, right? So the null hypothesis is they are innocent. What's the alternative? What's the alternative? They're guilty. They're guilty. Do you notice something? Those two things don't overlap. They are mutually exclusive and exhaustive outcomes. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. So every hypothesis test, every inference I make, I have a null and an alternative. What actually is the jury's charge? They need to observe evidence. What's the phrase? Beyond a reasonable doubt. Thank you. You see, you avoided the Perry Mason trap. Okay. Because Perry Mason, the TV show, which probably I'm the only one in the room old enough to remember, actually said, and it became part of the American vernacular, a shadow of a reason. There's no shadows. This is beyond a reasonable doubt. There is a threshold that we have to get beyond, but all data is evaluated, oh, excuse me, all evidence is evaluated under what belief? That the person is, it is assumed to be true, what? That they're innocent. So let's go through this. The null hypothesis, simply used to evaluate the probability of observing your data from your experiment. It's the one that is used to evaluate how likely this data set was to be generated. The alternative that is exclusive of the null, it's gonna be, is exclusive. It's the opposite of the null. That is your research, and this is the key thing. I, I run a Kaizen course where people, to help them understand statistics, I kill people on this one question over and over. What's a p-value? And a p-value, I know it sounds complicated,
but it's the probability of observing the data set or data that is even more extreme under the belief the null hypothesis is true. I actually use the information in the null hypothesis in the calculation. It is directly equivalent to the idea of how likely is this evidence to appear given the person is innocent. That's what the jury is commanded to evaluate. Here's the evidence. Hold fast in your mind. This person is innocent. Could this data possibly have been, or this evidence been generated in the context of an innocent person? You know, my, my, this, what I tell the students when I try to explain this to them, suppose that down in Uptown this coming weekend, someone dies, somebody's murdered, okay? And you find out, oh my gosh, I have Dr. Redden's cell phone, and Dr. Redden was down at Uptown this weekend. Okay, wow. Is that enough evidence to question my innocence that I was actually in the vicinity? You might find out that I booked reservations three months ago. It's my 20th anniversary, I was there with my wife, and that uh, I never even knew the victim. So there would be no, that's very weak evidence. However, if you find my DNA on the knife, my DNA on the gun, their blood in my car, all of these other things, those things are, that, that level of evidence is not compatible. The evidence is not compatible with the null. Same idea in a statistical inference. I take the statistics and ask, are they compatible with the null hypothesis. Same thing, okay? The, and there's this thing, there's a p-value and there's a type one error rate. What's the rule between those two? Do you know, do you remember? If the p-value is what? Less than or equal to the type one error rate, you do what? Reject, Reject the null hypothesis. If, the p-value is greater than alpha, then you fail to reject. You do not say, accept the null. Be careful, why? It is a one-to-one -one analogy between the jury trial and the statistical trial. I'm old enough that I was trained in the 80s. And you know what, they, we didn't use the word hypothesis test. We actually called them statistical trials. They, all the old textbooks actually called them statistical trials because they were set up for us to recognize the one-to-one -one movement through each of the concepts, okay? So think about that for one minute to support my comment about you do not say accept the null, you say fail to reject the null. At the end of the, court, uh, at the, end of the jury trial, what happens? The four person stands up, they hand the slip of paper to the bailiff, the bailiff walks it all the way over to the judge. The judge opens it, sees it, hands it back to the bailiff. Bailiff marks back. The person stands up, and there's one of two statements made. We, the jury, find the defendant. Pick one. Guilty. Guilty. They have rejected the null and concluded the alternative. Or they say, they didn't say innocent. No. Uh, they did not say innocent. You're right, they say not guilty. That's the correct interpretation because not guilty simply implies the evidence was not sufficient to reject the null. We never declare anybody innocent. That would be declaring that we know the null to be true. We don't know the null to be true. We could be making a mistake. We just say the evidence was not sufficient to declare guilt. What if they admit to killing a person on this? They're guilty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now the power, the thing about this is remember there's always the potential, anytime you make decisions, when you pick between A and B, there are two types of errors. You could reject the null, when the null is in fact true. That's terrible in our judicial system. We are sending innocent people to prison 
That is the one we want to avoid. That's why we call that a type one error. That is the one that gets us most, that we seek to avoid the most. But there's also the other one called the type two error, which is what? When you fail to eject the null hypothesis, but it's true. The alternative is true, which is when we let guilty people stay on the street. That happens too. Well, being a child of the 80s, I remember John Gotti, guy who was almost, at least everybody thought he was a gangster. But trial after trial after trial, he got off, got off, got off, got off. And people were screaming, what's wrong with our, ju our judicial system? Even the kids on the street know that that guy's a gangster. But eventually he was convicted. But the bottom line is, if we avoid type one errors, we increase the chance of type two errors. But fortunately, as your statistician, being your st personal statistician, I can design trials that maintain a good type one error, and I'll help you increase the sample size such that type two is controlled and low. You know what that's called? That's called designing a study with power. All power means is if the effect is there, do we have a good chance of finding it? That's why you meet with statisticians before starting the experiment. So we understand all these things, we set your type one error rate, but we take control of your sample size. And we have a long discussion of what's clinically relevant, and then I do calculations to say, if you want a 90% chance of finding that effect, if it's out there, I would recommend you design your study and have it put 75 people per hour. I can tell you that, and that governs your trial. Okay, we'll get a correlation later. Um, Y'all want a five minute real quick? Y'all need five minutes, you want me to keep going? I am still gonna get you out of here at 9.30. Keep going. Keep going, okay, well, you're having fun. you must be having fun. Okay, so here's the thing. Most teachers, including me, teach the rote habitual four steps of a hypothesis <coughs> test Everything I really do for a living, I learned in sixth grade. It's amazing. Uh, I state the null I, and the alternative. It's really the scientific method. State your hypotheses, collect your data, analyze your data, and draw a conclusion. That's what I do for a living, folks. That's literally why I help y'all do that for a living. But here's the thing. I have to state a null, and I have to state an alternative. I calculate an appropriate test statistic. I calculate... A, a, a statistic, and I say, is that statistic extreme, yes or no, based upon some probability distribution associated with this hypothesis test? If it's extreme, it means it has a low probability. All, if you ever hear a statistician say, well, that's extreme, all they've just said is, I think that's a low probability. Low probabilities, it's low with regard to, it's not what I expected to see under the null. So then we calculate a p-value and compare to a type one error rate. Now, I want to read something to you. I'm gonna translate something for you. It says, if the p-value is less than or equal to the type one error rate, reject the, the null and include the alternative. Well, here, we typically know our p-value. We typically say the type one error rate is about 5%, 0.05. We all use the 0.05. I'll tell you, I'll ruin your, your, your mystery of statistics in just a minute and break your heart. We'll tell you where the, I'll tell you where 0.05 came from. It's rather disappointing. But I'm gonna reread this sentence to you because I want to get to burn something into your head. When I see this, I don't read if p-value less than or equal to the type one error rate, reject the null and include the alternative. I read if the evidence, my p-value is my evidence, is beyond, beyond, below, a reasonable doubt, reject their innocence and conclude their guilt. It's one to one. If the evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt, 
reject the null and conclude the alternative. If evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt, reject the null hypothesis and conclude the research hypothesis. That's what I do. But it's very key to understand p-values are completely dependent upon that null hypothesis. That's why there's a reason I say the p-value is the probability of observing the data, or the data, even data more extreme, given the null hypothesis is true. That last phrase is the key to really understanding what's going on statistically. I have made a key assumption against your research. And then I'm asking, can that be rejected? Is the data actually endorsing your research hypothesis? All right, now here's, 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 here's the history. Here's the fun history, okay? This is what you don't get in stats class. Where did all this come from? Because there's a lot of pushback there are actually journals now that refuse to accept p-values because they have come under such criticism. Do you know what, folks? There's nothing wrong with a p-value. There's nothing wrong with a p-value. It's just you gotta be able to explain it right and not overstep it. Don't overstep it. And we're gonna play that game in just a minute. There's this guy named R.A. Fisher. He will spin in his grave if you say he was a statistician. He's not a statistician. He did not think of himself as a statistician. He was actually a really great geneticist. And he developed a lot of the underpinning of modern statistics because he needed to make some evaluations and he wanted to develop techniques and he became very well versed in statistics in doing it. He had a very interesting approach when he launched his version of hypothesis testing. He said simply, set up a null hypothesis. All I need is a null hypothesis, and if I have a null hypothesis, I can get to a p-value. So he said, calculate a p-value for that hypothesis, put it out there in the literature, publish it, show them this number. He never said anything about writing a conclusion. Do you know why? Do you know why? Y'all aren't talking to me. Was the coffee not strong enough? Not enough sugar? What? Why do you think he not did? Because he was trying to get the concept that academia should be a scientific jury. In a scientific jury, in a jury, why does a jury get hung? What? People disagree. People disagree. People view, does everybody have the same definition of beyond reasonable doubt? No. And that's part of the system. The system is to get a group of people so that if all of them are saying that's beyond a reasonable doubt, then that must be really beyond a reasonable doubt because you've got a model great. Okay? So he was like, Here's the p-value, is 0.07. Now for some, that would be somewhat convincing. For others, that would be enough to go on and pursue and pursue the research. For others, they would say, I have my doubts. But he was going to allow everybody in science to form their own opinion. That was his hope. It didn't work. Now, there's another group. I have three daughters. Uh, my wife's very happy because if we'd had a son, I was going to vote for either Jersey or Egon. <laughs> she didn't like either of those proposals. I was really kind of fond of Egon. <laughs> Makes me think about uh, Ghostbusters. Uh, Jersey name and Egon Pearson came up with something else. They came up with this. Set up a null and an alternative. You've got to have both of them. This is decision theory. They took us to decision theory and said, this is the right application of probability. Pick a type one error rate. 
so that you know this is my threshold. You're gonna give them a hard and fast threshold and then using the type one error rate, define a rejection region. And I still teach this. I'm the only guy on campus I think teaches this, where I make them draw the rejection region, cut it out, shade it, and if your data falls in either one of these areas, you just reject the null hypothesis. That's why, if you're ever confused by power, draw the rejection region. Rejection regions control power. That's all they did, but they didn't talk about the p-value. They were gone, they didn't do that. Now I need to tell you a secret. Naaman and Pearson had literally the nastiest relationship with Fisher. They hated the groups, I mean hated, can't really emphasize, can't get the word hate to mean enough. <laughs> for you to understand their disdain for each other. They decided that they were so, it was so, so much animosity. Naaman and Pearson relocated. They left Oxford and came to the Stanford, California, to get away from this guy. What year was this happening? It was all like in the 1930s. They really, Pearson, I hate to tell you the truth, Fisher, who they both controlled journals, go look. Fisher never was allowed to publish any in any, any journal that had either uh, Naaman or Pearson as editors, vice versa too. They were all at each other. And if they knew what we had done after they died, they would come and kick my butt. Because you know what we did? They completely disagreed. Look, Fisher, there is no alternative hypothesis. There's no type one error in his approach. Naaman Pearson never talked about the p-value. Do you know what we did in the 1990s? We took their theories and went, that fixes that and slammed it all together. And do you know why statistics is confusing? Because that's what we did. We didn't resolve a darn thing. We just slapped it all together and mashed it up and taught it as one happy idea. It's not. We merged the type one error and the p-value into trying to unify it. It's why power is the hardest thing. Under Fisher's approach, there is no such concept as power. The power comes from the Naaman Pearson approach. But the journals are fascinated with the p value. But the p value can't get you to power. So that's why it's always these things are confusing. Why are these things confusing? Because they weren't designed together. Don't worry, the methodologist can lead you through them. My second lecture is I'm going to teach you how to do power calculations, how to go all the way through it, okay? Okay, so the, here's the truth. What you, we teach as modern statistics is a bastardized version of two different approaches. Does this mean it's useless? No, but you've got to understand the concepts and to be able to carefully follow these concepts through this maze. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you where the p-value, the point of, where the 0.05 came from, okay? Fisher lived well into the 60s. I guess being a tough, mean person actually does have some benefits every now and then. He, he, made it, he had longevity, I'll give him that. He kept getting hammered about, well, what's your threshold? What's your threshold? Where, where do you, what's convincing to you? What's beyond a reasonable doubt to you, Dr. Fisher? And in a footnote, not joking, it's a footnote. In an article, you can find for some, one out of 100, excuse me, 10 out of 100 will be convincing alpha, Point one. For others, one out of 100 
will be convincing. Alpha is 0 0.01. But for me, five out of 100 suffices. 0 0.05. And that has become the standard. One of the things I will tell you very quick, and uh, this afternoon I will be in this room completely reconfigured meeting with an MD who's doing a genetic association study. And I'm gonna say your alpha is one in a million. Alpha 0.05 is not carved in stone. That's one of the things when you meet with people or methodologists, you need to ask what alpha level do you think is reasonable, okay? I've had the FDA come back and say, we want the alpha down to 0 0.001. To which I've come back and said, do you know what sample size you're asking for? To which they've said, yes. <laughs> it's your money. But they don't want that mistake. They, won't, they do not want to put that drug out there unless they are absolutely convinced. So how do you answer the reviewer when the reviewer says you can't call it significant because the effect size is impressive, but it's a P of 0 0.07, 0 0.06? All right, well, I, I pull out history. I come back and say, to define significance, there must be an alpha level, and the alpha level of 0 0.05 is arbitrary. I don't mean this bad, and I, I say it. Alpha of 0 0.05 is arbitrary. It is fine for you as well as your readers to use that, but other readers may choose to say, this is sufficient for this, this evidence is sufficient for me to be motivated to do further investigation. That's the only purpose of the p-value, is do we continue to follow this trail, yes or no? But guys, my p-values can never definitively answer anything. I've said it a thousand times, if you want truth, you're looking at the wrong guy. I am not the philosophy department. Okay, and if you want a proof, you still have the wrong guy. I'm not the math department. This is the biostats department. We have evidence and we judge evidence. And we judge it to be significant or non-significant, that's it. Okay? Now understand, since it is a bastardized version, does this mean it's useless? No, but you must understand it and recognize the limitations and not overinterpret significance. Just because you've got a p-value beyond below 0.05, do you know what that literally means? It means your edit, your means your data is kind of your evidence is kind of rare. That's all it means. The next step is where you take the leap of faith. Okay, and you use that to make a decision. So, I already ran on that ran, and the, the thing is you do not have to always set the type one to 0.05, though this seems to be convincing, con convention, and it is because it's very easy to do with last lectures, I keep putting it at 0.05, it should not be, keep in, keep in mind that the null hypothesis does not have to be equal, and it doesn't have to be equal to zero, I can write any null hypothesis I want that makes sense to you as a clinician, okay? Uh, most importantly, you must resist the urge to interpret the p-value as something it is not. This is where I got into trouble. I, I, you know, I had to stop a paper that was gonna go in on Monday. I read it, I read the whole thing. They asked, people asked me to read the stat section. I say, no, I'm going to read the whole thing. If, if you want me to do this, you've got to let me read it all. And this is a postdoc, and it was just a teaching moment that she said definitively, this, I'm going to just say this, this trial proved this, going back to my jury trial example, she pretty much said in her conclusion, this experiment proved the null. To which I said, coffee, 1015. This paper's not oh, We gotta fix that paragraph. You can't go that far. No more than if the p-value had, and because I gave her a non-significant p-value, and she said, that proved the null. Wrong. 
and it's equally wrong to say the p-value is less than 0.05 and therefore I proved the research hypothesis. Nope, you haven't. You have evidence in support of it. So we just gotta be careful. People always wanna go, and this is why we play true-false in my class. Read this and tell me, is it true-false? And if it's false, you gotta tell me why it's false. Can't, it's false. <laughs> Well, the researcher reports the p-value from his or her hypothesis test is 0.01. Let's say I tell you that we're going to set the type 1 error rate at 0.05. Okay, so the p-value is less than alpha, evidence beyond reasonable doubt. So I can reject them all. And, but the person says the researcher has absolutely disproved the null hypothesis. Do not, there's a 5%, still a 5% chance that the null hypothesis was in fact true, given that the null hypothesis was true, you would have gotten this. Don't use the word proved. Don't, if, it's due, if you've got a p-value, please promise me you will try to use, avoid the word proved. Yeah, I, I'm going to, I really went over the top, okay? I was going over the top. This, is the one that drives me insane. This is all over the place. Guess what? It's still false. <sighs> Complete bastardization of the interpretation of a p-value. The p-value measures what? The probability of the data set. How compatible is the data with a hypothesis? So all it is is a measure of compatibility. To be able to say, first, don't tune to the other thing to avoid in your write-ups, don't use true and false. Don't say this is true. We don't know if it's true. We know the nature of our data, that if the null hypothesis is true, what we have observed would be likely, or it would be unlikely, depending on the nature, what the p-value is. But please avoid stating whether, you can't say the null hypothesis is true, false, anything. The p-value is just a probability, it's a probability of observing the data, given a set of assumptions. Absolutely prove the research hypothesis, don't use the word prove. This is in psychology everywhere. This is also wrong. Based on this information, assuming the researcher rejects the null hypothesis, there's a 0.01 probability he or she is making the wrong decision. No, that is confusing Naaman and Pearson's ideas with Fisher's ideas. The bottom line is the 0.01 is the probability of the data being observed as extreme if the null hypothesis is true. This is confusing type one and type one and p-value. It's not true. Okay. Um, this is a classic one. This is a classic one. This is all over the literature. This is wrong. This is why people are consistently saying stop using p-values. This is no. This is wrong. You get PLAs are fine. You just got to be careful. This is flipping it. Remember, the probabilities are about what? The data. Just remember that. The probabilities are always about the data, not the hypotheses. The fact, that, but this is what people want to say. They're so desperate to say this. It slips in. The probability that the null hypothesis is true given the data is 0.1. No. It's actually the probability of observing this data, or data even more rare, given the null hypothesis is true. You've got to keep it in, in the way you keep yourself safe. How do you keep yourself safe? Jury trial. Go back to the jury trial. The jury trial. What do you assume? I assume the person is innocent. Oh, that means I've assumed the null hypothesis. 
then this is the probability of the data assuming the null hypothesis is true. That's exactly the correct, that's, that, that last one is true. And in fact, you'll see that when I'm working with investigators, when I report a p-value, all right, we, we all have our big table one of p-values. I actually had to argue somebody down one year in the VA of, we're not doing it. We're not putting that column p-value there. We'll never get it published. Please trust me. We're not putting that column there. Why aren't we putting the column there? Because the p-values you want to put there, you want to calculate by a method that is completely inappropriate for your design. Well, they'll never understand it. Yeah, I'll write the letter to the editor. They'll understand it. <laughs> when we submit it, we will put a footnote here. The reason the p-values are not attached is simply because from statistical theory, a two sample t-test this, in this design would be completely inappropriate. So would be a non-parametric test. I got it published. Haven't worked with that investigator since, though. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard other people say you don't need to add a p-value in table one if it's not your central hypothesis. That's exactly it. I would agree with that. I would agree with that because I'll tell you what, because a lot of people will say in table one, I'll go through all these p-values, and if they're not balanced, I'm going to put that into a regression model. You know what? As your methodologist, I'm going to turn that table one completely over, not let you see it, and say, as a clinician, you tell me what matters. You tell me what I need to control for in this model that you think will improve the strength of the model, p-values be damned. I want your clinical opinion. Okay. False, 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 false. The fifth one is the Bayesian interpretation. There is a branch of mathematics that tries to get us there. I think it has its role in science. I truly do. There is this false belief that you have to be either a frequentist or a Bayesian. It's like kind of like being a false belief that you got to either be a Democrat or a Republican. There are people who actually stand in the breach, folks. So there are times if you have the correct design, I'll let you get to, to number five and help you interpret it correctly. Okay, let's do a quick example and then let's get out of here and let y'all get to some things y'all need to do, okay? Uh, let's just walk this through. This is back with the cholesterol levels. I wanna to try to sew this back together, okay? All right, and this is where I will reemphasize those three key points. Basic teaching example, I actually use this in the honors bio test class, so please don't be offended. We collect a small random sample of 10 men, 12 women. We will use alpha equal to 0.05. We're just asking ourselves, um, can I declare that the means, the popular, the means are different between men and women? So I would calculate, this is what we do. We immediately go to the statistics. Stop, why? What did I tell you? Probability distributions, pass their characteristics into the data. By summarizing the data to a level of statistics, I am able to start making some judgments. So I do this. I come in and I look and I go, huh, men are about five points higher, about five points higher. Uh, not surprisingly, men are more erratic than women. There's more variability in the men. Those are the two things, but I have two anchors of where the means would fall. They're relatively close. And then there's noise. Men spread out a little, a, a little bit more. Women, their distribution from their data seems to be more compact. All right, that tells me something. There may be some hint that there's a difference between men and women. Can we formalize this into a jury trial? Sure I can. Now this is the big leap. Notice something. I put Greek on the board. 
It's Greek. Why did he put Greek on the board? Because I'm emphasizing something. The pro the null and the alternative are always about probability distributions. They're never, ever, ever about the data. You're making a declaration about probability distributions. If mu1 and mu2 equal, I'm saying there's one probability distribution. I'm only going to believe there's one probability distribution generating all the data. It doesn't care whether you are male. It doesn't care if you're female. There's just one distribution governing both the sexes. The alternative says no, there is sufficient evidence in the data to believe that there are two distributions out there functioning. One that are ge that's generating cholesterols for women in the female population, or better yet to say the female population has a distinct probability distribution, whereas the males have a distinct probability distribution. Do we have sufficient evidence for that? Well, back to the scientific method, I summarize all my data, and I get my evidence. My evidence is 0 0.0142. Is the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt? Yes. Therefore, I would simply come back and say, we have sufficient evidence. We have sufficient evidence to reject the null and conclude the alternative. And I would say that this experiment provides significant evidence at alpha equal to 0.05 to conclude there are two probability distributions governing cholesterol and they differ by sex. That's it. I could be wrong, but you know what I did? I just stated, I, I'm just the reporter, folks. I'm just the reporter. I have said the trial has provided this evidence. And if you use this, this evidence, you will draw this conclusion, or excuse me, if you use this threshold in conjunction with that evidence, you will draw this conclusion. I want to go back to something you said, which is very insightful. I did a five-year multi-site clinical trial, summarized all the data, sitting in someone's office who is the PI, and the primary hypothesis, the, the whole goal, the central aim generated a p-value of 0 0.0502. Wait, it gets worse. The PI, and this I'm not disparaging, she started to cry in front of me. She started to cry. Is that a correct interpretation of statistics? It's correct. Uh, um, it is looking at the world. The reality of the it world. is looking at the realities. <laughs> I got it published. And I got it published. And it actually came in. It was, you know, they do the awards. They do the awards where, you know, the best paper in this field. It came in third that year. It came in third. I was rather proud of that. I came close to having an award. I almost had an Oscar. <laughs> it is reality. I do not disagree with you. But we have to be able to stand up and help people be rational about this. That's the tail wagging the dog. Everybody, and the bottom line is, let me, let me point out something. What this was all about was is the behavioral is the behavioral intervention as good or better than drug that's what the research hypothesis is as good or better and i'm at 0 0.0502 do you think that people should be offered the chance to try behavioral therapy first? Heck yes. And that's the way it was interpreted 
by the editors and by the scientific community. But I did put it out there. I was not going to hide the fact. That was 0 0.0502. But there's a joke, and you can come into the Biostats office, in you know, one of the boards in the hallways, we have this thing that says, students, remember, God loves the p-value 0.06 just as much as he loves 0.05. Okay? What is the T in that agreement? What is the, T? the T is the special, it's one of those things. Remember when I said, one of the reasons you meet with the methodologist, I can't teach you all the different approaches. But when I estimated those variances, if I have to estimate the variance and plug it in, that guides me to a special distribution called the T distribution. And that's one of the reasons I don't think you want to spend four years deriving and knowing where all these distributions come from. I found it rather enjoyable. But uh, that's why when the, and that's one of the things is like when, when you're doing a regression, in regression, I, I meet with this guy who's doing his dissertation the in three weeks. He's overwhelmed with, I didn't realize there were so many hypothesis tests in one regression. Welcome to my world. I'm helping him pick. Talk to me about what your science is. Stop looking at the p-values. Turn it over. Talk to me about your science. Then I turn the, it back over and say, this one is the one that tests that hypothesis. Okay? Oh, uh, let's see. This is the way I'd write the conclusion. That is literally what I try to get people. If, and they don't have to use that exact paragraph, but I want to discuss this with them. There is ev sufficient evidence at Alpha Point that to reject them all and conclude that the mean cholesterol le levels differ between the men and the women. That is name and Pearson right there. To me, that's the safest. That is what people want but people are infatuated with the p-values. And therefore I come back and explain and literally drop. I make them, I try to, in all the papers I publish, put the de correct definition in one sentence somewhere so that they recognize we're paying attention to this. The probability of observing this data or data more extreme, assuming the null hypothesis that there is no difference between men and women, that there's no difference between their probability distributions is 0.01. There's a one in 100 chance that we would have observed that data. Okay. Um, I'm not going there. I'm going to hold off. I'm going to let y'all go. I want y'all to digest this. This is enough from the fire hose today. <laughs> We'll pick up next week. I'll refresh it and then we'll start doing the injection regions and how you, the great skill you're going to need, how to talk to a statistician about power. Okay? Just how to talk to them about power. Because if sometimes you may have a better understanding of it than the methodologist. Thank you. Okay? All right. Get, get more, more shots.